I think someone said in a, in a quote, it's like the future is not only weird, it's weirder than you can even imagine. You know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. like, so it, it's, it's, it's some of that. It's like, yeah, on one side, it's completely away from us. We can never kind of touch it. And then on the other side of it is like, well, we have some agency in this to like move some things around. And it's like, we're not, I mean, look at us, you know what I mean? Like, look at us around, like we're controlling the earth's climate and stuff like that. We're going to be in the fossil record, et cetera. So like, there's, there's definitely two sides of that coin. And I guess maybe coming out and uh, uh, maybe using some definitions like dark ecology or hyper objects mm -hmm. and maybe a little bit of a, a, a transition because it's like, you know, the COVID uh, thing, climate change, though could, uh, those obviously are, are um, arguably, excuse me, could be hyper objects and really like things that just change everything. It's a completely different re uh, orientation of, of, of how we not just live through the life, but I think what you were talking about earlier, integrally, like how we even think, how we even think yeah. about our consciousness of that. So maybe we can just riff on, on that kind of little paradox a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that to be really interesting and it's, it's not a resolvable in, mm. in the sense that yeah. there's some kind of synthesis. It's, it's Good actually, point. and again, this sort of extends the, uh, I'm using it broadly because uh, the scholars for metamodernism were talking about the oscillation again between irony, sincerity, modern and postmodern. And I think for, for this context, for us, we're really saying there's these other oscillations that are always going on, right? Like mm. in, you mentioned hyper objects. So to start with the climate crisis, um, Tim Morton talks about this in many of his books, particularly hyper objects, the, the, right. the book that I think kind no of started <laughs> 2013, uh, I believe. Yeah. Like we yes. started everything. Yeah. 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 It's really, yeah, it's been around for a few years now. Um, yeah. the, the idea of a hyper object, it is this very complex distributed thing, which is a thing or a force. It has a reality to it, even though you can't really like pinpoint exactly where it exists. It's distributed over space and time. So yep. the climate crisis is a great example. You can imagine a kind of, uh, very complex, uh, a collage of different events, uh, little things from driving your car to the fossil fuel industry, uh, to, you know, extracting resources for our computers. And you can kind of get this amalgamation, amalgamated image of all of these processes human beings are doing large and small in little ways, like driving our cars every day or big ways, like what, again, the fossil fuel companies are doing, et cetera. Um, the agro industry, another another example of the kind of monocrop destruction of bioregions. You just you, you could just pile this on. That's a hyper object. Right, it seems right. to be something distributed over space and time. Something we're all kind of ensnared and entangled in. And that, in it, in in turn, climate change is entangled in the biospheric processes of the planet. So Earth's mm -hmm. homeostasis, uh, how the Earth is able to regulate its temperature through um, the the breathing of the planet, right? Yeah, uh, storms, extreme weather, etc. Yeah. So so it ends up getting getting into this very complex thing, and we can't say it's not a thing. It's a force. Right. It's a reality. It has a reality to it, but it's not something that we can um, see like you can in a, in a Renaissance painting, an object with perspective or put under a microscope. It's right, much right. more distributed and entangled. Mm -hmm. And so that's a hyper object. Right. Um, and so for us, yeah, I, I think that that gets to be where the, the, the oscillation between we can do all this great stuff now with technology and science and industry. And then also nature seems more powerful than ever, which is the two oscillations of, of the critique of the anthro Anthropocene mm -hmm. and then uh, the, the kind of triumph of it. Like, well, let's lean into that and actually do some great good things that help. I mean, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, recent yep. book, Ministry for the Future, yep. has examples like that. So what do we do? Where do we end up? Like, what end of the coin do we do we land on? It, it seems like it just keeps spinning, right? Right. And right. so- uh, I forget if this is exactly an answer to your question, but but basically, yeah, that's how I understand hyper objects as a kind of um, assemblage or uh, collage of all these different things distributed over space and time that none, nevertheless has a kind of efficacy or reality or force to it. Right. And the climate crisis is exactly that. And again, getting to one side or the other, do we lean all into mass engineering projects to save the planet? Mm -hmm. I mean, that might be on the... Uh, on the table, or do we kind of go in the, the other end and say, okay, no, no, everything needs to localize and become bioregional. Wendell and, Berry, and small it. farm. Yeah. Wendell let's Berry. It was Wendell Berry. It dude. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to lean on that end of the oscillation, but I'm not, 
I'm not discounting that there may need to be certain events that we all need to come together and, and sure. do at some kind of massive level. Uh, sure. So, so I, yeah, I, I tend to hold both uh, in terms of the future, but no, that's, that's great. Cause I, like that um, oscillation is a good word from it because it, it's not uh, inert by any means. And, and it's not uh, constantly moving in one, it's constantly moving between and just uh, going through. I, I, I like that in the sense that um I, I, I was just thinking, and maybe we can riff on this a little bit and see what your thoughts are on this, but uh, I was just thinking of the specificness of, of when um, Buckminster Fuller said, like, operating manual for Spaceship Earth. You know, that's one of my favorite, you know, books. I read it kind of like once a year, you know, just as like, because it's so easy. It's like 100 pages. And he really got me thinking on all this. Like, he his, his catalytic thinking was on a whole nother level. And so uh, for Buckminster Fuller, though, it's, you know, he basically saw that there was like different paths, you know, going towards things. And he kind of set a fate of us. If we go through the clock in the future is that like right now, you know, the Russians are uh, like, he, he involved the earth as like a spaceship. So the, the Russians were at ahead of the, you know, flight controls, the United States were like driving, you know, China is doing other things. So it's like, everyone has their own uh, capabilities within the system, but then no one's like talking. You know, and so he had an uh, uh, operating manual for Spaceship Earth. It was about how we can kind of all get on the same page. And so I wrote an essay called Updated Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth because I really thought that in a lot of those things, it was like, well, it's not going to, my main thesis was it, it's not going to be in one book. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like this top down thing where it's like, here's an operating manual, like an operating manual for a spaceship, like for our cars and stuff like that. And what I kind of posited was it'll be like the thousands upon thousands of different indigenous communities and different narratives and different cultures from all around the world kind of bubbling up into like what all of it was. And then I don't want to say too much into like, I guess that's maybe the new sphere if we really get into kind of it, but it's like, it's, it's literally the bubbling up of all of those kind of cultures, consciousnesses. And then that's what the updated operating manual for spaceship earth would really be more so rather than like some top down approach. So I don't know if you want to kind of riff on some of that, like bottom down, obviously there's something to be said about, you know, mass engineering, uh, uh, the, the fusion energy, you know what I mean? Like we could maybe use some fusion energy, you know, and like doing CERN and atom smashing and all this other stuff. Like, yeah, Yes, there's something to be said. And then even at the highest of cultural levels, uh, you know, getting together for, you know, new, you know, all those kind of things. But let's, I guess, just un unpack that a, a, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. I, I love the image of, of the, the next manual being something that's kind of uh, a, a meshwork of different uh, communities. It's like a neural would, network database. Yeah. That, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, something like that. Yeah. I mean, intuitively, that, that sounds right to me. And again, because... I do lean more towards the the bio regional Wendell Berry, yeah, um, right. you know, localization. I, I think that do, that does tend to be the direction I had, and I think that's also the direction that Bruno Latour talks about in terms of, you know, this this trajectory of the modern kind of going towards globalization and more extraction, and yep. then finally out of this world is really it, that that line or that trajectory is 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 exhausted. It's it's not going anywhere that we want to live or we can live. Right? Right, as he talks about, it's not a habitable world. Mm -hmm. So I think the 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 turn is always towards the terrestrial, as Latour talks about, or or That's as Gebser talks about, mm -hmm. to, to to concretize, right? Is moving towards concretization away from more abstraction. Yep. Um, so I'm for all of that. And I think honestly, that that's really the only way we can become planetary. You mentioned planetization earlier. And uh that, that was a, a Tehard word. Mm -hmm. Uh he he coined it as as this process of uh we, we can get into the interesting kind of weird wooey stuff with the the Noah sphere and everything, but but I mean, essentially he was he was sort of mapping out this process in which human societies find each other around the globe. And yes colonization happens and capitalism happens, but he was more interested in, in that interconnectivity of the whole planet of human mm -hmm. societies around the whole planet to create this sort of thinking layer of the earth is how he described it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the way to get there towards this planetization of the, of earth of Gaia is through anything top down. Um, it seems like, and we've, we've been trying that top down. Yeah, yeah we've, we've tried it. Like, it's like, we've yeah. tried it this way, that way, up ways. It's like, we've tried yes. it that way. Yeah. <laughs> right. And we're even trying it with, with digital networks, which is unfortunate because I think the structure of technology is 
has much more of a radical potential just in terms of how we orient and that's i think why i'm going to grad school for sts like this fall is literally because of that because it's like i grew up with technology and seeing all of this stuff and it's like well wait a second like it's not exactly ethics but it's like it's design it's the cultures it's it's everything about this but it's like what really gets me is that like no one is talking about this no one is no talking and it's like this should be like specific you know we we deal with technology every single day and it runs our lives but we have no education on like really how to deal with it and that's like something that personally i'm trying to like look into more of you know 